And so the wider the world market, the greater the choices you have. In addition, if you take every good idea on the planet this year and you weave them together into American productivity, you're going to have more good ideas than if you only take the American ideas. So that being open to the world allows you to have both more consumer choice and it allows you to have more understanding of ways of being productive that are good, that are good for competition. I mean, in a sense, Arnold Schwarzenegger, by coming to the U.S., created a major export industry. I think it was Terminator 2 that made $200 million overseas, which is, which is literally the same as selling textiles or shoes or something else. He had created a product which earned a foreign exchange for the U.S., and yet he originally, of course, was born in Austria. But whether you're importing a human being or you're importing an idea, I mean, many ideas now come to the U.S. We and the Japanese are the two highest value-added producers of new ideas on the planet. So somebody in France will invent something, we'll market it. Uh, and we and the Japanese are basically in competition to see who can market better. Uh, the, other, the other part of it is that when you have to compete inside a global economy, it's the same as belonging to a regional football league or belonging to a national football league. When you've got to compete in the highest level of competition on the planet, your factories get better, your managers get better, your inventors get better, and you just have a different level and pace and pressure of creativity. So by being in the world market, you keep your country at the front edge. And to the degree that you withdraw from the world market, you allow your, 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 your own companies to be less competitive. This is a big problem in Europe now, where the more the Europeans protect their industries, the more obsolescent their industries get. Whereas Ford, for example, which is a world company, had to go through an excruciating cultural change to compete with Toyota. Volvo, Mercedes, uh, Renault, Fiat, they didn't go through that big a change. The result is Ford is now a generation ahead of any European car company at being competitive. General Motors is in the process of going through the same change. Chrysler is going through the same change. Uh, and the result is the two most efficient producers of cars in the world are Ford and Toyota. And they're, they're almost indistinguishable now in terms of how competitive they are. And they play head to head. The really great, and they're great European car companies, but they're dramatically more inefficient. They have a much longer turnaround time on new models, and they have much less effective use of resources. And over time, that eats you up. It means you're not competitive. Now, in that setting, let me suggest to you that our goal here, and I really have to thank my wife Marianne who first came up with this, is that local jobs through world sales defines the new reality. One of our problems is to get across to people. This is not about overseas jobs. When we talk about the world market, it's not about fancy people overseas. It's about scientific Atlanta, which now has a five-year backlog of orders. So in North Atlanta, scientific Atlanta is employing several thousand people, selling all across the planet. And it's that kind of continuing process of Coca-Cola, which makes money everywhere on the planet, practically. And so there are jobs in Atlanta which come directly out of Coca-Cola. It's, it's interesting, Georgia Trend Magazine had a 20-page section entitled Global Connections. This is the December uh, 1994 issue. And they have 20 pages of listings of companies in Georgia that have specific uh, relations to the world market. So this is literally about how do we create local jobs through the world market. Because that's the reality we're now dealing with. To understand how we do that, we have to start with certain societal aspects of competitiveness. That is, compared to other countries, what's our taxation, regulation, litigation, education, cultural values, and government structure like? Let me carry you through. Does our tax code encourage saving and investing, or does it encourage consumption? If it encourages consumption compared to the German and Japanese tax codes, guess who will have more money available for the next generation of factories? So when you talk to the biotechnology companies, where of the top 15 products in the world, all 15 are American. Their major problem in creating new jobs, and over 100,000 high-value-added high jobs now in biotechnology, their major problem in creating new jobs is they can't get enough capital to build new factories. They can't. It takes hundreds of millions of dollars because of, of, of our next item, which is regulation, to bring a biotechnology product on the American market. So if you can't find the money, even if you have the idea, you can't market the product. And so Japanese and German companies are looking at buying our biotechnology where we have a dominant position because they have the capital. We don't. Second is regulation. Uh, it, takes, uh, it, it now takes almost as long for the regulations for building a computer chip factory to be processed as the lifetime of the computer chip. 
So even if you solve taxation and you have the money, and you're told, well, now you can come to Thailand and break ground Tuesday morning, or you can file for an EPA permit and in three years we'll solve it. You may conclude, because of the speed of change in computers, that you have to go offshore just because you can't afford to deal with American red tape. The third problem is litigation. You're told you could do this in Germany, and there they have a loser pay system, and there are very few lawsuits about this. Or you could do it in the US, and there are 23 trial lawyers who'd like to meet you Tuesday. Which, which system? And by the way, Edwards Deming said that litigation was one of the two major things, healthcare being the other, that made America non competitive. I mean, he singled out litigation and the degree to which this is a litigious society where you graduate more lawyers than engineers. And then you compete with Japan, which graduates more engineers than lawyers. There are more lawyers in Georgia than there are in the country of Japan. Just to give you some sense of scale. Fourth is education. I mean, to do quality right, you have to know math. The average American high school graduate does not know enough math. In fact, the average American college graduate does not know enough math to do the math expected of a typical high school graduate in Japan. So if you're going to do quantitative analysis, if you're going to set up a systems approach, if you're going to say, what is, you know, what is a common occurrence and what's a unique occurrence? Remember when we did Deming? In order to build the statistical model, you have to have a better ability to do math than most Americans have. And so corporations find the education level is not only not acceptable, it's decaying, particularly in the inner cities. So you're less likely to be able to hire somebody to compete in the world market if your education system collapses. Fifth is cultural values. And if you're competing with somebody who still believes in the work ethic, and you're competing with somebody who gets up every morning thinking about how can I win this competition, and your culture now has said, well, don't be a workaholic and don't push it, and after all, you know, you really don't want to, you don't want to be a rate breaker. And again, we, we find, for example, honor students who get beaten up now because in, in some inner city schools, they're seen as being deviant because they want to study too much. Well, how's that going to compete in the world market? So cultural attitudes matter. And finally, government structure. I mean, do you have a government, you know, when, when you learn that, for example, as was recently reported, there are 27 factories in China that are pirating American products, openly pirating them, and the Chinese government says to you, uh, we won't stop them. You have an obligation to have a government which is aggressive enough and competent enough to hit them hard enough economically that they can't afford it. And if you are, if you are too slow, too soft, too confused, you can't, you can't be competitive. And so you've got to have a government structure, which, because in the world market, governments are like blocking backs in football. I mean, if you don't have a government which is strong enough to protect your interests, the companies can't survive because they're up against nation states. And so if the other side says, my government will help me cheat, your government won't help you at all. Guess who wins in the long run? And that's a very key part. If you're going to have a free market on a worldwide basis, the government had better be competent enough to be a good, a good referee. Because the other side is going to have a government that intervenes on their behalf. Now, when you look at those larger issues, what I want to do now is come back. And I want, I want you to be looking for how the five pillars of American civilization relate to success in the world market. What are the historical lessons of American civilization? And we're going to use some examples. What, what does personal strength mean if you're going to be competitive? How does entrepreneurial free enterprise uh, factor in? What does the spirit of invention and discovery mean? And what is quality as defined by Deming? And, and how do all five of these begin to relate to competing in the world market? And what I want to start with is the notion that there are actually two models. And, and before we put them up, well, they got excited to put them up. One is the welfare state, which is good, they stop. 